or down in Australia, because my student was Australian, uh, we co contrasted this, this uh, dove, I believe it is, that's <coughs> found across the arid lands of Australia with another, sorry, it's a parrot, and then the doves are these two which are in northern Australia. And so the point is, obviously we need the clarity, but this aerial definition sets a single criterion. And what that does is it means that biomes or biogeographic units in some sense that are big get left out. You know, if you look at Sophia leucoptera, it is tightly confined to a single bi biome and in fact to a single biome between two rivers. And it is found nowhere else on Earth. But it's more than 50,000 square kilometers. The Andes are a narrow mountain chain, just like the Eastern Arc Mountains here. And so, almost any species in the Andes, especially at high elevations, will be closer to that 50,000 square kilometer criterion than almost any species in the Amazon, even though each fills a single biome or a single set of conditions or a single biogeographic unit. So essentially, one, we certainly need a multi-scalar approach. Why 50,000 square kilometers? Why not 40,000 square kilometers? Or why not 100,000 square kilometers? Is it just convenient because 50,000 square kilometers gives you about 2,500 species? And if we used 100,000 square kilometers, maybe, we, maybe we'd have 6,000 species and it would be too many to work with. Is it just convenience? But we're losing a lot of biology. So really what, what we end up seeing is that an area-based definition of endemism, or forget about that, that single word, an area-based definition of important, an area-based criterion of importance of species is going to discriminate among biomes or among regions based on their grain. Small grained regions, maybe island archipelagos like uh, parts of Indonesia and the Philippines, or mountain chains like the Andes, <coughs> they're gonna be the big winners. And the big losers, I've already shown you over and over again, are the big foot footprint areas. Even though they're diverse, as Rodrigue pointed out, they're diverse, but oops, they're big. <coughs> and so they get left out. So this is just a commentary on the need to be explicit, the need to ask questions about the products that people throw at you, especially people who want money or who want effort or who want you to join their cause. And that's not just, you know, getting money out of rich people. It's getting scientists to join causes. Okay? You need to demand that clarity, and endemism is a perfect example. I don't know who had the word first, the biologists or the public health people, but that's an initial confusion. And you know, I work in both fields, and so I get into all sorts of trouble because I use the word endemic to refer to restricted to a particular area, and the public health people are looking at me like, huh? And vice versa. But even within biology, we've blown it with endemism. There are area-based definitions, and there are region-based definitions, and we're never careful about defining what endemism is. So we really need that clarity. This is a, a deeper point than what I've said so far, but if we use primary point-based biodiversity data 
in our biodiversity analyses, it has a world of, it, of advantages. Points, in theory, have no area. And so we can use a point or a data set of points at very fine levels, at medium levels, and at global levels. Now there's a, a lower level set, a lower limit set by uh, the spatial rev resolution of those points, the uncertainty associated with them. Okay, if a point is accurate to within a few kilometers, then we can't go down to a local landscape level. But the, those point data are relevant at every scale and resolution coarser than their uncertainty. <coughs> Patterns in biodiversity will frequently or maybe even universally be multiscalar. Remember those maps I showed you of Mexico, where at one spatial resolution, <coughs> the inventory of plants of Mexico is completely finished. And then at other spatial resolutions, the inventory of the plants of Mexico hasn't even started. And the answer is that both are right because they're at different scales. So when you distill multiple scales and multiple answers and multiple outputs down to a single map or a single answer, it's usually a bad idea. Now maybe it's a very good idea if the reason you're making that map is to raise money or is to convince people or teach people who are not thinking very deeply about your map, okay? But generally, a single answer or a single output or a single picture is going to be a pretty bad idea. So, any questions? Well, that's a good question. So if you have a plant that, for example, becomes invasive and spreads in other regions, um, does it stop to be endemic? That's, that's another little detail of our definition. Um, if those are, a lot of people will make differences between um, natural spread versus um, human-assisted spread or a human subsidy in, in range. But I think if you saw a species spreading naturally, you would essentially revise your idea of its geographic range, okay? And so then it would lose that endemic status. Moses. Yeah. I, my question is, is endemism depend, it, uh, depends on species present or sampling effort. I so is endemism dependent on this, the presence of the species oh, or on the sampling effort? This is because, for example, um, 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 I may sample a particular area and I get a new species. I say, okay, I publish it, this species in Demigay. And maybe after three years, he sampled in, uh, in Benin and get a lot of that same species, mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. of them, and and now will it be like count, counteracting my paper or what? Right. So right. does it depend to sampling effort or species present? Well, I think I think when we speak about endemism, we're speaking about the state of knowledge at the moment. So when you published your description of that new species, maybe <laughs> it was known only from the type locality, mm -hmm. and you know, then the question is, what is its full geographic range? But you know, if you get it, if you get your new species and it's you know, one of your extremely cryptic microplants that, um, and maybe it's in a biome that's very extensive, then probably in your species description, you should say, you know, at the moment, this species is known only from the type locality, but our guess is that 
it probably occurs across this biome, which is all of you know central Cameroon or whatever. But if you know if the species is restricted to a you know a single mountain top, well, if the type locality is in a biome or an, an ecosystem that has an, a very small extent, mm -hmm. and you feel that it's isolated <laughs> from others, like your Thysmiaceae, mm -hmm. then maybe you say in the description or in some subsequent paper, best guess is that this species is here and nowhere else. Okay? But I've certainly had a lot of fun over the years taking very simple niche modeling techniques and taking species known only from the type locality and doing kind of very local, I don't even want to call them niche models, distribution models or maps of environmental similarity. And many times what you can do is, you know, if this is that exact site where the type was collected, the only individual that was known when the species was described, many times if you look for similar conditions a kilometer away or 10 kilometers away. Many times you find more populations. I mean, very <coughs> rarely or perhaps never is a species consisting of a single yeah. individual, right? So there's probably a local population and you don't know whether it extends tens of meters out or tens of kilometers out or what. Okay? Yeah. Sean? Yeah. Just to <coughs> to better understand the concept of the endemics. For instance, I find a, a species is found in Amazon and uh, nowhere else but also in Benin. Mm -hmm. Can I say the species is endemic to in Benin when I consider Af Africa, for instance? Um, if your universe was Africa, that's a bit of a strange definition. I would rather say that the species is endemic to the Amazon and Benin, or Earth, right? <laughs> um, which is to say the usual way that we manage the term endemism is endemic to this area, usually a single area, yeah. So you could say you know, endemic to the tropics, endemic to Earth, but endemic to the Amazon and Benin, or within Africa, endemic to Benin, we're getting into some murky territory because, okay, what about outside of Africa? Is it everywhere in Europe, but in Africa only in Benin? You know, so I'd, I'd rather just say, you know, I think simplicity found only in the Amazon and Benin. Okay? Other questions? Yes. Just to get it more clear, can mm -hmm. barriers cause certain species to be endemic in a given place? I think the, so the question is whether barriers can cause a species to be endemic in a particular place. And I think that's the usual reasoning that, um, and this is the subject of another class, but we usually see um, species distributions as constrained by the conjunction of their uh, requirements in terms of the environment, you know, maybe a particular interval of temperatures or, or uh, humidity values, uh, by interactions with other species, and by barriers. And usually species are constrained by those three in differing, um, differing quantities or differing levels, but a conjunction of those three. So for example, let's say, you know, mountain gorilla in one sense is probably limited by not tolerating warmer temperatures that are associated with, with lowland habitats. That's at one scale where I'm here and I'm not going to go a kilometer that way because the elevation goes down and a kilometer that way it's warmer or it's drier, or it's wetter, you know, some local tolerance. So that's, those are environmental requirements. But then a, at a different scale, you say, why are mountain gorillas only in these mountains in, in East Africa? Why are they not in the Himalayas or in 
uh, the Cameroon Mountains. That's more of a barrier thing. Okay? That's, there's a vast lowland area, and probably the gorillas could survive on those other mountain habitats, but they've not gotten there. They've not been able to disperse there. That's a barrier. So again, it's multi-scalar. Okay? 